the dumbest shit you will hear all week. You're listening to Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong. Welcome to episode 168 of the Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong podcast. I'm Dave Roberts. With me is the owner of the Georgia Virtue, writer, journalist, dog mom, Jessica Salaji. Hello. How was your week? It was, it was good. How was yours? Busy. Busy. And they get busier for, for people in my industry as we go along. As we go along. But... Yeah, as, as, as we get hotter and hotter. But I did have a good conversation with uh, the HVAC lead uh, instructor for Chattahoochee Tech. And he's got some people that he's going to send my way for hiring. So that's good. That's exciting. Yeah, it, it is. Spirits. <laughs> exactly. Is, uh, uh, yeah, the first thing, if you think you know anything, you don't. I'm going to reteach you everything you lot you thought in school. Or no, I just I I'm old. My knee hurts. I need help. Carry this shit. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's just I it the stuff that I've been able to do on my own for years and get on my hands and knees, getting crawl spaces, and and you know I've got knee surgery coming up. I I just I just can't do it anymore. So it's time to bring in some some younger people and let them make some money. There you go. Look at you boosting the economy. Yeah, hand me your young men. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> oh my gosh. So we have a poll shows tight GOP primary for Georgia governor. Uh, internal poll commissioned by who else? <laughs> Vernon Jones campaign conducted by the GOP firm Remington Research Corporation or group, sorry. Shows Kemp with a narrow 39 to 35 percent lead over Jones among likely Republican primary voters, putting him just slightly outside the survey's three percent point of margin error. Ooh, I feel so much like I'm on Fox News. Well, I can tell you that I despise at least 35 percent of um, Georgia Republican primary voters. That's strong. That's right. That, you got to understand. There's there's a good portion of that thirty five percent that is enamored with with Fox News that don't actually know the issues. Yeah, I don't and, care. That that makes me hate them even more. Yeah, but these things will that's be worse than liking him for. Along. That's like liking. That's worse than liking him for him. Does liking anybody him like him for him? Him. <laughs> Ooh, shots fired, Jessica. Mm-hmm. No, I, I like I said before. I don't necessarily know that 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 Vernon's a bad guy, but he is. Uh, <laughs> but he is. Uh, but that's going to widen as we get closer to the primary because right now nobody outside of DeKalb County or obviously outside of this audience or people who are who are educated in what's going on actually know what Vernon Jones is and what he did as. DeKalb County CEO, as a state rep, his constant need for affirmation from the voters and running nonstop from, for what, 20 years, 25 years now, uh, all this is going to, all this is going to shape, shake out as this goes along. Right now, people are, 35% of the potential Republican voters are enamored with this image that they're force fed on Fox News that this guy broke with the Democrat establishment, that he is pro-Trump, but they don't really dive into who and what Vernon Jones is. Well, my favorite, there's two things that I really enjoy about the poll. The first is that, well, three things, I suppose, because I think it's quite, I mean, it's quite remarkable to have an internal poll um, run by a, I guess, second tier type candidate um featured on the hill.com but um so you know props to his bank account for paying them to run the story i don't know but second candace taylor you know you may like her you may not like her you may not know who she is but she's running too and she does have some name recognition because she ran for senate and 
she's on the ballot, like, or she's planning to run. So to have a poll with two candidates when there's already at least three in the race is, is dumb. And then... It, no, it's disingenuous. It, it is dismissive of Candace Taylor. And then also, I'm not sure if anyone was adding those numbers up while we were talking, but that equals... Um, A little over. Um, girls aren't good at math. Yeah, but those... <laughs> the, it's over 100% when you look at the actual numbers on the on the polling. Man, look. First of all, internal polls are supposed to be internal. And you <laughs> yeah, only release exactly. this. And look, and, and I've only been on the inside of a couple campaigns. Uh, you obviously have more experience than I do uh, being on the inside of a campaign. But you only release this information if it helps your side. And the fact is that the way, however this poll was worded, favored Jones. And he leaked it. And this, there's no way this gets leaked without the candidates uh, uh, okay. Well, that s- s- somebody was sitting, sitting in a, a, the proverbial smoke-filled room going, ah. Oh, this poll looks pretty good for us. Let's leak this one. What about this other poll? No, that one looks really bad for us. We're not going to leak that one. So they polled 1,040 people in Georgia, obviously. Um, 1,040 people. Mm-hmm. Woo! And then they asked, what is your opinion of Donald Trump? What is your opinion of Vernon Jones? Um, 33% were favorable. 20% were unfavorable. And 47% had no opinion. Um what is your opinion of Brian Kemp? 45% favorable, 41% unfavorable, 14% no opinion. And then um, the question, the fourth question was, if the 22, 2022 election for governor were held today, would you definitely vote to reelect Brian Kemp or would you consider another candidate? And then 35% said reelect Kemp, 55% said consider another candidate, 10% weren't sure. Then they went to the 36, 30, whatever. And then it says, I will now read you two brief statements you may hear during the 2022 primary election. Please indicate after hearing each statement if the information makes you more or less likely to vote for Brian Kemp. And then it said, Brian Kemp side with Stacey Abrams and refused to investigate the 2020 presidential election. 18% said they'd be more likely to vote for him. 57% said less likely. 25% said no difference. And then they said... Donald Trump has openly called on someone to primary Brian Kemp in the 2022 Republican primary for governor. Donald Trump knows Brian Kemp cannot be trusted. And 19% said it was the same margins pretty much. 19% said they would more likely vote for Kemp if they heard that. 54 um, less likely, 27, no difference. So, you know. Then after I- then after asking those questions, they asked again. So now that you've heard that, like, who are you more likely to vote for, Brian Kemp or Vernon Jones? And the results are the same. <laughs> I am sick and tired of the Donald Trump wing of the Republican Party. Look, Donald Trump did some good things. He did some stuff that wasn't so good. Uh, but overall, he was, he was a, a net positive. I do not want Donald Trump being the standard bearer of the Republican Party because he is not small government. He is not small taxes. He is not he's not pro freedom. This is the same guy that instituted a slide fire ban, which you can be for or against that ban, but he did it via executive order and put a one or several small businesses out of business. By doing that and put people on the street, manufacturing jobs on the street by doing that, and he did it non-legislatively. So you can be pro, you can be pro policy. Most of his policies were great, and I benefited uh, three and a half years out of the Trump uh, presidency. And COVID's not his fault. Uh, I did much better on taxes and everything else through through Trump, and I could admit that and say that if he ran. Again, I would vote for him again if he were running against Biden again. But to say that this is Trump's party, that we're going to judge our gubernatorial candidates on whether Trump likes him, kiss my... Well, I'm here to tell you that nobody gives...
what you think, or at least 43% of Georgians don't, because listen to this. So the last question was, thinking about the various types of voters within the Republican Party, which type of voter do you consider yourself to be? Traditional and establishment, 17%. Evangelical, 22%. Trump Republican, 43%. Libertarian, 4%. Outsider, 4%. Something else, 9%. That's overwhelming Trump identifier. It is, and evangelical and all that stuff. I, I, and, and That's the Virginia read Galloway it. crowd. It is, and you can see it on my bio when, when you pull the page up. I'm a, I consider myself a Republican. Uh, the Republican Party left me when it went to the left. I didn't, I didn't move to the right. I've always been the same small government, uh, individual freedom person that I am today. But I didn't move. The party moved, and the party moved left, and continued to move left, and continued to move statist. You know, I, I stand by the Republican standard of, at best, re, uh, government is a tolerable, or is a, uh, 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 was a tolerable, uh, uh, nec- or, uh, I'm sorry, is a necessary evil. I can't even talk tonight. Uh, at worst, it's an intolerable one. And I stand by that, is government should be small, should be weak, and should have the least amount of intrusion in our lives. But every time a Republican gets, gets elected, they, they expand government on their end. Every time a Democrat gets elected, they expand government on their end. And those of us who have half a brain are sitting in the middle going, what the hell's the matter with you two? Get out of my life. Republicans want to tell you who to sleep with and who to marry. Democrats want to tell you whether you can deduct that person. I don't know, man. I will say, speaking of libertarians, that Shane Hazel had a wonderful exchange with uh, Vernon Jones uh, the other, last week. I was about to say the other day. Uh, last week, where on Twitter, uh, Shane calls uh, Vernon out on not showing up to 25% of votes. And Shane, and uh, uh, Vernon basically just insults Shane's intelligence, which is not a very good idea. Because even for a Marine, I mean, Shane's really, really, really smart. Uh, he also has the best voice in podcasting, and I hate him for it. Uh, he, he is a friend of the show. He's been on the show. Uh, we, uh, he is running for governor on the Libertarian ticket. A real but libertarian, ca- not a Republican libertarian. Right. Not not a Dave. He's a shame. <laughs> 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 but uh so Vernon goes after him, calls him and says something you missed the brain train. And it's not it wasn't even a witty comment. Like, if you're gonna zing somebody, that one really missed. Like, you're gonna call a Marine dumb? I mean, Jesus, they eat Marine, they eat crayons. I mean, you're going to call a Marine dumb? That, that's not insulting. And then uh, uh, Shane comes back, and Vernon deletes the post. And Shane's like, no, I already copied it. Here you go. If, if you want a copy of it, here. It tags him back in the post. It was beautiful. I mean, it was a beautiful piece of, of trollery. I mean, Matt Lowe would be proud. Yeah, it was quality. And, of course, I, I, I liked and shared it on my page and, and all the government pages here in Paulden County and, these people that have been running around going, oh, Vernon Jones, he's the guy we need. Uh-huh. So, Georgia Democrats, pollution from gas-powered vehicles disproportionately affects minorities. <laughs> Jessica, help me out here. I don't know how to help you out on this one. I, you know, that's the headline of the article. It ran on CBS 46 here in Georgia. Um, and it has to do with the money in the American Jobs Plan that Biden wants to put $174 billion to electric vehicles. And, you know, one of those things is that he wants to put them towards his, his electric school buses, which is wild and expensive. And farmers are already pushing back um, because, you know, I, I, just, I don't know how you're supposed to use an electric, like, diesel. I just, I can't. But... Electric School Bus sounds like a damn band. It's really, it sounds like a good band name. Augusta Mayor Hardy Davis that said, incentivizing more electric cars will 
help solve social and economic justice issues because pollution from vehicles disproportionately affects low-income communities and communities of color. Okay, uh, let's stop there for a second. Well, that's uh, you have to stop there because that's all he said. And so it's just become like a, a tagline okay. you attach to whatever issue is of the day. How is making automobiles more expensive going to help uh, disadvantaged communities, regardless of, the, regardless of their race? How is it going to help people in Appalachia that, that need to buy a $500 pickup truck? How is it going to help the guy that lives down, down in Atlanta or in a neighborhood that's trying to get upwardly mobile, mobile or lives out in the suburbs that's trying to get mobile to find a job, how is making an automobile a $120,000 investment going to help minority and poor communities? I'll tell you something. The person that needs to get to work to Subway to make your sandwich does not give a damn about the emissions that come out of their vehicle. They're worried about getting to work so they get a paycheck so they take care of their families. And they don't give a damn about what the school bus burns. I was kind of I was kind of sideways with Paulding County when they went to they went and bought propane powered buses. Oh, it's so much cleaner. You dumb shits. Propane is a derivative of crude oil, just like gasoline, just like diesel. It's just on a different column of the of the refining schedule. So propane buses don't create any less emission because you still have to produce the gasoline to make it. And they're supposed to be educators. But anyway, I digress. Uh, the, the pollution that goes into making the batteries to push these buses. Uh, and plus, where do you think that electricity comes from? Unicorn farts? It comes from burning coal. Overwhelmingly comes from burning coal. I guess we just put solar uh, solar panels on the tops of buses, and kids can only go to school on sunny days. I don't know, man. This this the social justice stuff is is out of line. Well, it's it people are going to become numb to it. No, absolutely, and, and I think they already are. I think they already are. It disproportionately affects the the uh, uh, minorities and poor. Well, what doesn't? Uh, the rain disproportionately affects the poor because they have to stand out at the bus stop. Okay, flooding dispropor- disproportionately affects the poor because uh, uh, they can't afford a hotel room to go to. Okay, yes, of course it does. It always sucks to be poor, but it's supposed to suck to be poor because you're supposed to want to do better in your damn life. That's the whole idea of the American dream: is do better for yourself, do better than your parents did. Disproportionate. Let's just make being poor so comfortable that 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 you just want to stay poor, and that's what's happening in this country. Is we're we're turning the safety net into a hammock. Well, but I, we have I, to I classify just, five people off into victimhood. I mean, every everything is about what the class of victim people are. Right, and 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 of course, I I don't qualify for many classes of victim. I guess I guess I'm fat. I guess I'm a, a, I'm calorically challenged ah, man i it's just it's just so asinine at this point uh that people keep falling for this stuff and people like the uh ted terry come out and just say that automakers now automakers are racist no they want to sell cars they don't care if you're black if you're white if you're hispanic if you're chinese they don't care just buy my car Hell, it is so much so that uh, Toyota has two names for the Tacoma. It's the Tacoma and it's the Hilux, other places, because they really don't care about your background. It's whatever name we can call it to make you buy it. We don't care. If electric vehicles sold better, they'd sell more of them. But the fact is they're expensive. The charging station to have at your house is expensive. And if, if you work an hour away from home, Do you really want to get stuck in a position where you're going to... Okay, let's use Connie's example as I just smacked the mic. Connie's example from a few years ago when we had the snowstorm where, you know, she was running out of gas. The the snow's piling up. She's running out of gas. She gets to a gas station that has it, pays cash, gets gas, gets back on the road. If you were in in an EV, 
What are you gonna do? Sit there for three hours while the snow's piling up, waiting for your damn uh, Elon Musk mobile to to recharge? No, the internal combustion engine is a is a better solution to most people's problems. Now, if you're rich and it, you're in my position where, where Connie works 15 minutes from home and she could take a, an electronic, she could take an electric vehicle to and from work just fine. But those of us who have to spend time on the road, that's not a really good solution. It's not a really good solution for what I do, which is a service industry. It's a horrible solution. I can't have a, a tech making what he makes per hour sitting on the side of the road with a, with a extension cord plugged up to his damn van waiting for it to charge. It's stupid. All right. Now that I've gotten off my soapbox, sorry, Jessica. It's all right. A fifth federal court has struck down the CDC's eviction ban. Yeah, I guess I have you been paying attention? I didn't know that four other courts had had done that. Man, I'm paying attention to the temperature outside. <laughs> so no. So no. Short answer is no, ma'am. Hmm. Well, they they did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I read that. So a judge in the U.S. District Court of D.C. ruled last week in a case brought by two realtor associations in Alabama and Georgia that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's ban on landlords filing to evict non-paying tenants vastly exceeded the agency's powers. Well, duh. I mean. Oh, that, that, that is much nicer than I was going to say. Well, yeah, man. No kidding. No, I don't know what gave anybody the idea that the CDC had the authority to tell private landlords that they can't foreclose or they can't evict people who are not paying rent. I, I it, it never occurred to me. It would occur to me that it would make it to five federal courts. I mean, five of them said no. Two of them said yes, though. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, fine. Well, no. Still 60% said no. But it, of course it exceeds their powers. Of course it does. It exceeds the president's power. He, by no right, can tell a private landlord that he cannot evict someone who doesn't pay rent. Well, yeah, the CDC is not a... I mean, they, they don't have the enforcement. It's it, well. It's, it's not in their in their sector of fire, and they need to get back in their box. You know, go back to to feeding Fauci lies. I I don't know, man. It just it just it, at a certain point it becomes stupid. It, and it, this is this is the problem with liberal politics. Is it feels good to say that well you're out of work and you shouldn't be evicted from your home. This is your home. What about the guy we've talked about this on the show? The, the family that's renting that, that, that building out. We always think of landlords as some rich guy sitting up in a penthouse somewhere, just you know sitting on his couch counting $100 bills. And oftentimes, it's a family that had to, that had to move. And many times, it's especially around Columbus and Augusta and other military towns, it's a, it's a military member that has been transferred somewhere else that put their house up to rent because they want to move back there. So you're telling them that they just they can't make their mortgage because your tenant just decided I'm not going to pay my rent or I can't pay my rent and you can't get rid of them finding a new tenant. So screw you. And, and if you pass it along to the bank that has the mortgage, well, guess who owns bank stocks? Almost all of us own bank stocks in our 401ks and our IRAs and our mutual funds. Almost all of us own bank stocks. If you're in a mutual fund, you own a bank stock. So when you screw them, you screw yourself. The fact is, if you don't pay your bills, get the hell out. When's the Supreme Court going to take this up? Uh, 2038. I mean, By the time, I'm, like, this is just ridiculous at this point that it's gone on this long. It's been a year. It is, and, and here's the, well, they weren't hearing cases. So everything's, everything has, has stacked up. And I assume they're going to wait until Biden gets a chance to pack the court, if he does after this next election, 
before bringing this up because four, four new Biden appointees would, would certainly help the case. I just don't think it takes a, a, a higher education to say this is right and this is wrong. Taking something that's not yours and using it without paying the owner is wrong. Not to mention, rental prices are way, 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 way up. So even if I'm made whole as a landlord for what you didn't pay, I'm still losing on what I could have gotten by taking this, this, this asset, renting it out to somebody else at 25 to 50% higher. So even if you retroactively make me whole, I still lost mm-hmm. that much money. Not to mention the money that I may have had to pull out of my investments accounts that were that were that were going up in order to make the mortgage payment that I was depending on you to make as my renter. But nobody cares about, about the landlord. Oh, he's just he's just a rich a hole. Well, Speaking yeah, of courts, problem. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's he's the bad guy that that put a roof over your head and. Every time, every time you call and say my air conditioner's not working, send somebody out, or my toilet's plugged up, send somebody out. Yeah, he's the bad guy. But all we see on TV when we watch when we watch TV shows or movies is the slum lord. What an awful guy he is. Ninety nine point nine percent of of landlords want to do right by their tenants because they want their tenants to stay. Because turnover is expensive. That's why landlords offer discounts for tenants who st- who extend their lease, who renew their lease, versus going and finding a new one. They, you know, besides being good people, there's a business reason for wanting to retain your customers rather than have them turn over. But I guess that that that's too much of a, a, <coughs> a foreign concept for the the liberal wing of of our country. Maryland District Court Chief Judge bans thin blue line masks over bias concerns. Oh, my God. <laughs> so it's limited. The, a public defender asked them to do this, and it's not limited to visitors in the courthouse. It's um, clerks, bailiffs, and judges. But my question, and it's not addressed in the article, and I couldn't find it before we recorded, but what about jurors? Because you're talking about the general public, but when someone's a juror, like they're not, they're not just a visitor. They're part of the process. Is he going to tell jurors what they can wear? And what right do you have to tell me what to wear as long as it's appropriate? Well, the other thing too is like he's he's saying that it's biased because he's taking the political connotation that this is I mean this hasn't had for decades. I mean, it's supposed to be the the gap like us between the people and evil. They stand in the gap. It's not it didn't used to be this pro cop defund the police thing. Yeah, and I remember when it was a I won't say secret, but it was it was not an it was not open to the public. If there was a blue line on a vehicle, that meant that someone that it was quietly telling police uh, police officers, "Hey, I know what you do. I know, I know you 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 stand the line between us and them." But it's just stupid. Uh, is he going to ban uh, MAGA shirts? Is he going to ban uh, uh, BLM? Now, look, if he bans all printing from his courtroom, that's fine. But if you're going to have someone in a BLM shirt or a BLM mask uh, and let them sit and then tell the person with a thin blue line to get the hell out, that's a problem. It's also a problem that if you're telling someone to wear a mask, this is the mask I have. Kiss my ass. It's a public courthouse. It's public. I'm not saying you can do anything you want in there. But it is. It, it, we love to say it's his. It's his courtroom. No, it's not. It belongs to the taxpayers. You are temporarily occupying that bench as long as we pay you to do so. And when we decide that that we don't want you there, you'll go home. And you'll be just another lawyer. Meh. 
But yeah, he has he has absolutely right to tell the clerks and bailiffs not not to uh, not to wear something because they're employees. And the public defender and the and the prosecutor, he can tell them what to wear. They're employees. But you can't tell me and the gal and the gallery what to wear. As long as I'm appropriately attired, you cannot tell me that my mask with a with a blue line across it is inappropriate. What if it's off blue? What if what if I do a teal? Is that okay? Is red, white, and blue mask okay? Or is is that too divisive for me to wear an American flag mask? Jack. This is a good time to remind you that these are our opinions and not those of anyone not on the show or any respective company for which we may work, own, or otherwise associate ourselves with on a regular or irregular basis. Local government problems. Garrett Rolfe will be instated to the APD. Woo! Yeah. Garrett Rolfe was the was the officer who was involved in the shooting at Wendy's. Rashard Brooks. Uh, Rashard Brooks, uh, who was who was stopped, I say stopped for DUI. Who was passed out in the Wendy's drive through. Uh, asked to pull up. Uh, one of the most professional videos I've ever seen of an interaction between an officer and and a a, a, a drunk. Up until the point where this guy decided to snag a taser, run away, and point a taser at a police officer and get shot several times. And I'm tired of seeing the shit where he was shot in the back. Just because you're hit in the back doesn't mean you weren't turning and trying to fire at somebody else, which, which is what happened. But we're not going to get into the facts of the case. Uh, Jessica, what happened with his firing? Well, um, the shooting happened on... June twelfth last year, and then um, he was fired on the thirteenth. And you know, at the time, that's when Atlanta was burning. Um, and I guess it came out during the hearing that they had given him one hour to reply and appear and and speak on his behalf. Like when they notified him that he was going to be terminated, they gave him one hour because Keisha had a uh, press conference that she wanted, to, and she wanted to be able to tell people. Um, and so basically the Atlanta civil service board ruled that the firing process was not done, um, in accordance with the city code and multiple times throughout the process, like of how it all worked. And even just the fact that this is now just now being appealed and heard is all of it is inappropriate, but they violated their own ordinances, um, in, in what they did. And, and supposedly, they have this process for an emergency termination, but the board said, again, you didn't meet the standards because you didn't do any of the stuff that justifies a, um, an emergency termination. So, um, APD put out a statement, which really pissed me off because <laughs> like, who are they to say anything? But, um, it said, it is important to note that the CSB, the board, um, did not make a determination as to whether Officer Rolf violated Atlanta Police Department policies. In light of CSB's rulings, APD will conduct an assessment to determine if invis- additional investigative actions are needed. Like, they're stepping in it when they shouldn't step in it at all. And then freaking Keisha chimes in and says, the dumbest you will hear all week. Given the volatile state of our city and nation last summer, the decision to terminate this officer after he fatally shot Mr. Brooks in the back was the right thing to do. Had immediate action not been taken, I firmly believe that the public safety crisis we experienced during that time would have been significantly worse. Well, she just helped him in a civil suit against the city. Keisha, you ignorant slut. Uh, First of all, political pressure is not a reason to fire an officer. And I'm not. I'm not saying that idealistically. I mean, literally, it is not a reason to fire an officer. Now, look, he he was he should have been placed on administrative leave just like anybody else. He will have his day in court. Uh, I think he was overcharged. I think he'll be acquitted. But I'm not a lawyer, and any of the legal beagles that listen to the show can certainly uh, tell me why I'm wrong. But. I don't, I don't see him being convicted here. Do we have any lawyers to listen? Uh, one or two. Hmm. One or two. I'm sure I, I've driven them off with, with my uh, <laughs> uh, uh, lawyer jokes. 
Like, why do they uh, bury lawyers 12 feet deep? Really deep down, they're good people. Oh, God. (laughs) But, first of all, APD should have said nothing. If they said anything, it would be, we're going to abide by the CSB's decision and place Officer Rolf on administrative leave. That's it. That's all that need to be said. No political statement. No, nothing else. That's it. Period. We're going to abide by their ruling. In fact is, you would not be, and I'm not saying you, because you and I both work for ourselves. Nobody listening to the show that works for somebody else would be pleased with their employer talking about disciplinary action to the damn press. And, and just like you're talking about with, with, with Keisha Lance Bottoms helping out the, the civil suit is they're poisoning the well for this guy to go and work for another city and just move on with his life. Once he's acquitted, which I believe he will be, they're, they're poisoning the well. So whenever they pull up Garrett Rolfe, this is what they're, what they're going to find. You know, I was talking to a friend of mine today. He's like, does he really want his job back? I said, no, he wants his 10 months of back pay and benefits that he's owed. There's a, there's a process within the APD to fire somebody and they crapped all over it. And this is not the first time they've done it. The, the other two officers that were involved with the taser uh, of the, the two kids were fired immediately and had, and again, the same board came back and said, no, you had, you couldn't do that. You have to follow due process. These are the same people that are in charge of arresting every one of us. If they can't follow due process for their own, what hope do any of us have? And every person out there who's protesting for for uh, for justice reform and everything else should look at this and say, if they can't police their own, if they can't follow their own policies and give due process to their own, what hope does the general public have? Because this is how they treat their own. As soon as it, it hits certain political checkpoints, they say, okay, screw them, fire them, charge him before all the evidence is in and ruin his life. And that's what they did to somebody who's one of their own, who was trying to take a drunk off the streets. What hope do the rest of us have if we're driving through Atlanta and they decide that we're politically incorrect, that we're a problem? What hope do we have? We don't. Because this is what statism is. This is an executive at the city level given an edict that this person is guilty, fire him, charge him, and and throw him in jail. If she could do away with the, with the judicial process, you know she damn well would have. Well, did you did you read the quotes from the attorney for the Brooks family? Yes. Uh, so there's two attorneys. And right. one of them said that... They were disappointed and confused by the board's decision, particularly since the criminal case against the officer has been bogged down in the courts. Quote, it appears that Rayshard Brooks's life didn't really matter and the world has moved on, adding that Rolf has received more justice than the Brooks family. Now, he said that. And the other attorney, Justin Miller, said, you have a person who is going to stand trial for murder who is now back on the force and able to do the same things he was doing before. Okay, so wait, hold on. Um, the first guy said it was he that... Rolf got justice because it wasn't done right. And he did place the blame at the board and the, this, I mean, in his other, in his longer quotes, he, he placed the, um, it squarely at the feet of the council and, or the city. But then, so he says that, that Rolf got justice and it moved faster and more justice than the Brooks family got. And then the other guy said that it's not okay. And that he's going to go back to work and do the same things he was doing before, which is not true because he's going to be on administrative leave no matter what, whether they terminate him again or he stays on the job until he's, you know, convicted or exonerated. um, He's going to be on administrative leave. So he's not doing the same things that he was before. No, he's told. Not, well, I mean, I, the lawyer, 
Look, he's... <laughs> Jesus H. Christ. He's not going back on the road. He's on administrative leave. He's doing the same thing he has been doing the last 10 months, only now he's getting paid as his employment agreement dictates. Now, look, if you want to change the employment agreement going forward, that's fine with me. That's fine. You tell officers as they're coming in that if you're on administrative leave, it's unpaid leave. If you po- if you shoot somebody, it's going to be unpaid leave unless you're exonerated, in which case we'll give you back pay. That's fine. But that's going forward. They violated their own policies. You know, this this is not a case where where Rolf made this up, where he's he's out there marching saying, I deserve my pay. No, no, no. This is what they promised him when he signed his name on that piece of paper. Jack. And that he get more he get more justice than than his than his client's his his client did. Kiss my he hasn't been to court yet. He has not been to trial yet. This is the the extent of Kinko saying we're not going to fire this guy for being arrested until he's until he's convicted. He's just keeping his job. His his court case is still pending. Wow. You sensationalist pig. These people are potential jurors too. Like these people who have these opinions that you know he should be fired and. This is so stupid. How could the board do this? And, it, you know, his case, the court, the, like, they just don't understand. And I'm so tired of people ranting no, about they under- things they don't no, understand. No, they understand fine. They're race pimps. And this no, is what there's they a do. lot of people who don't understand that this has absolutely nothing to do with the criminal case and that oh, he you- actually put himself on out there more. Like, in most cases, the the worst thing you can do is talk. You shouldn't talk about anything. But him going up there and, and saying stuff and <clears throat> getting on the record, I mean, that can all be used against him later on. And he assumed the liability to do that. And, and people I, don't I, even I, recognize I, that. I would assume it's because he has nothing to hide. Everything I did was on video. I have nothing to hide. You know, that... that and, 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 you know, and, and I admire that, but, you, but you're right, is th- the number one piece of advice you get if you're charged with a crime is shut the hell up. Shut up. Don't say anything. Don't do anything. If we need to sue your employer, we'll do it after the criminal case. Shut up. But he went out there and he won. But, you know, I, I, I think uh, you made the point that he should get a change of venue. He should, and he should also ask for a bench trial. Right. Yeah, I mean, but he, he should get a change of venue, just, just like we heard with the Chalvin trial. And, and all that's, it's, it's going to be it's gonna be held a mistrial. When you've got jurors wearing BLM shirts, one juror saying they felt pressured. Uh, you've got what's-her-name out of Congress showing up, uh, uh, saying that if, if, they're not find, if they don't find him guilty, they're going to riot. Uh, all this stuff... All you're doing is making Derek Chauvin, who I think is guilty, go free again and have and have another trial because you guys can't shut your mouths. I don't know, man. Of a similar issue, nepotism, lacking policy enforcement, creating strife in Screven County. Yes, Screven is a neighbor of Bullock where I am. Um, this is a story that I covered last week. It's you know, nepotism is a, a big problem in South Georgia, and sometimes it's sometimes. But aren't it's a, you all related down there? Well, I'm not related to anybody down here, not a damn soul. <laughs> um, but it, it for like a lot of places, you know, it's a problem. Nepotism is a problem, not for um, unethical or malicious reasons or nefarious reasons, but because they don't. I mean. And you can make the argument that maybe they shouldn't be a city or a town if they can't find people to serve and all that stuff. And, of course, you can have those conversations. But the fact is they these governments exist and there's not enough people who are willing to serve or to work for the cities or the counties. And there's nepotism problems. But in Screven County, they have a nepotism policy um, banning nepotism. And they also have a fire department um, policy manual for personnel that also addresses it. So it's like, it's double banned. Um, Double secret probation. Yeah. But um, 
they and they they the, here, the problem was it was one of those things where the nepotism thing it was the root of it but there were more underlying issues because like a lot of rural counties um where there's not full-time people or maybe the most qualified people running things um their policies are out of date like some of them have not been updated since the late 90s um this one had been updated like via handwriting um like with x's through it and like see attached and 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 that's just a bad way to do it and then on top of all that the nepotism policy um and the process for disciplining employees was um amended in 2005 but unfortunately they didn't notify any of the employees um so a bunch of employees who have been there for forever um like we're operating on a different, they didn't even know that policies had changed. So like if they were disciplined or something, they, and they went to appeal or find out, you know, what they should do. They're going off of a manual that they were given and signed off on. And the county's like, no, no, we have this new one. Um, just kidding. We didn't tell you about it, but it's, it, it we passed it in a meeting and, and putting it in a meeting and having it in, in the minutes and stuff is not sufficient for notification of current employees. Um, so anyway, and I don't want to talk too much about the people because the people involved, I mean, sure, they know it's wrong, but for me, it, the buck off ultimately stops with the county manager, county administrator, and the county commissioners, like whomever those people are or whoever's serving in those positions, they have the duty to make sure that these policies are enforced. And in Screven County, the fire chief is married to one of the firefighters and the training officer. So he's supervising um, his spouse, and it that the issue has also gone the other direction in the from the perspective that um, – his wife had disciplined a former firefighter um, and his appeal was like, or his like not even appeal, but you know, the, she wrote him up and then the next step was for it to go through her husband. And um, of course her husband upheld. Well, yeah, he was sleeping in the bed. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, <sighs> look, nepotism is very broad. Obviously, the wife writing somebody up and them appealing to the husband is a problem. But in some of these smaller counties, there are only three or four prominent families. Uh, even in Paulding County, there are a lot of people that are related to the same related to the families. Uh, so when you when you broaden nepotism, hell, my father when he worked to work for Delta Airlines, he and his cousin both worked for Delta Airlines, and they had to keep that secret. They had different last names. They were uh, obviously from different mamas and, and, and all that stuff. They were, they were related on their mother's side. But they had to keep it secret because nepotism was such a no-no in Delta. You can't, you can't get him now. He's retired after 40-something years. Um, but the, the passing it in the uh, essentially undercover of darkness, not notifying the employees, not sending a memo, not sending a policy change to everybody is a, is a failure of leadership. Of elected leadership, for that matter. Yeah, it's really unfortunate because <clears throat> it's led to, well, the one um, firefighter was fired, and in the articles on the Georgia Virtue, it's kind of complicated and convoluted, and the husband and wife factor doesn't really make it any easier to understand. And um, but it is unfortunate because that kind of thing lowers morale like two other firefighters have left and you know these counties and and those guys are i say those guys those folks are hard to replace particularly in a in a small area like screven county where the salaries aren't awesome that your your draw to being a firefighter in a small county is doing good for your community well the issue you know, when, is more that, you know, on top of that, on top of the employees, you know, they have a lot of volunteer firefighters and it, it just impacts everybody when stuff like that happens. And, um, and true to form, like all these stories, you know, one thing comes to light and then it's like a domino effect of other things. And, um, 
so there's going to be more out of Scriven County, but it's just unfortunate that something so easily preventable, like I appreciate that, you know, his wife wants to be a firefighter, but she doesn't have to be a full-time employee. She could be a volunteer firefighter. And if you really wanted to like manipulate the system, which I'm not suggesting that they do, but she could work in, um, like under the public safety umbrella where he's not supervising her and she could be over training and something else like training for maybe EMA and for the fire department. And then he's not supervising her. She still has a job and you eliminate that problem. But yeah, I cannot, I cannot think more of a third rung of hell than for Connie to work for me or for me to work for Connie. Uh, it, it, mm, it doesn't sound like it'd be, a, a really awesome home life. And of course, I work for Connie anyway because mm-hmm. she's the boss. So I want to get to this real quick because I, I think it's a really good story. Is the insurer for Georgia City to pay one point seven million to business owner in harassment suit? Mm-hmm. The city of Stockbridge, Stockbridge's insurer, will pay money to uh, Eric w- Whitson, owner of Georgia Championship Barbecue Company. The 2017 lawsuit accused Stockbridge City Councilman uh, Elton Alexander of repeatedly retaliating against Whitson's restaurant when Whitson declined to give Alexander a free meal. Jessica, is there a free lunch? There's no such thing as a free lunch, but um, this guy has had, Elton Alexander's had all kinds of ethics complaints against him, and his his colleagues are actually calling for him to step down if... Um, you're not a good example because you are subscribed to my newsletter, but you don't read it. But if you are a <laughs> reader of my newsletter, I talked about him two weeks ago and his, his colleagues are calling on him to step down because like he's caused the city so much bad publicity, so much money. And, um, and you know, sure. $1.7 million isn't coming out of the city coffers, but the insurance policies are going to go up and they're constantly having to deal with him. And they're just the, his colleagues are over it and they want him gone. But uh, declining to give uh, getting a free meal, like, you know, there's no, there is, if you go somewhere and you have a service or you are provided with a good, you should be, you should expect to pay for it. Sure, there are extenuating circumstances where I could understand where somebody might think that like they got slighted or something, but that's not what happened here either. No, first of all, if, if I were elected and I was in my, in my constituency, the last thing I would do is would be to take a free lunch from a from business owner. The last thing. Even if, if it was awful, I would just say I'm not hungry, pay, tip, and move on. Uh, and then run down to McDonald's and get a hamburger or something. I, I don't know. But the last thing I would do is make a scene in front of my constituency about uh, this and bash a, a, business, a business owner that's paying taxes in my municipality. What a jackass. Uh, Whitson's lawyers will get 534000 according to the terms of, uh, uh, obtained by the, by the AJC. 534000 just to the attorneys. That's wild. Yeah. <sighs> And you know what? If nobody else besides the attorneys get paid, that should be enough to oust this jackass. Just, it's one thing. If you go out to lunch with somebody and they're an elected official, I mean, look, if I, if I take a politician out to lunch, I know I'm going to pay. It's not that, you know, it's not that I'm expected to. It's just one of those things. But if someone comes into my establishment, I don't, I'm not expected to give them a free meal. In fact, I, I say that uh, I've I've been out to lunch with with several politicians that re- absolutely refused to let me pay for the lunch. One actually was Martin Mumptahan. Uh went, went out to lunch with him, and he absolutely refused to, to let me pay for lunch. He bought lunch. Well, that's a little mind blowing. No, no, no. Martin's a good dude. I, whatever you think of him politically, Mar- Martin's Martin's a su- is a super nice guy. Mm-hmm. But he he's one person that that absolutely just. 
if I took you out to lunch, I would expect to pay. Uh, I just, well, it's one of those things. Well, well duh. I know. I, you've been, you've been helping me along on this, on this podcast for, for two or three years now. <laughs> of course I, I, I would buy, but it's, it's, but it's, it's not even that he was a politician. It's just, you know, we went out to lunch. I, I offered to buy. He's like, no, 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 this is, this is on me. I, I, I'd helped him out with some air conditioning stuff, but no, uh, but it, Martin absolutely was not one of the guys with, with alligator arms going, eh, I just can't reach the check. Eh. Uh, but that's not what happened here. He went into an establishment expecting to get a check saying zero, which makes him an a-hole. doesn't matter what level of government he's at. He's an a-hole. I don't care if I'm out to, uh, out to lunch with Donald Trump. He should at least reach for the check before I do, before I say, no, 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 sir, I got this. And this guy was like, no, no, I, I deserve a free lunch because I'm elected to Stockbridge City Council. Really? That's your claim to fame? Hell, even Vernon Jones has more of a claim to get a free lunch than he does. I'm sure he's had a lot more free lunches than that guy has, too. Jessica, do you have any closing thoughts now, now that I've, I, I have beat that into the ground? Um... No. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I I think I'd like some um, listener feedback. I and I don't I don't want your advice, Dave. But I <laughs> I have a mole problem in my backyard, and I, like. I want I want to hear from people how they've like, successfully like, gotten you get like moles in your back. What's going on? Yes. Do you see a dermatologist? No. I want to I like I think, you know, I would just put like a stick of dynamite in the mole hole. But, but apparently you can also do that. So my new uh, favorite term is going to be mole. Hole. <laughs> I think that'd be a great tip line for the Georgia virtue. <laughs> People. Not how can we do better on this podcast, but tell me how to deal with my moles. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would not go Bill Murray on those, uh, on Caddyshack. Not that you're old enough to know that movie. <laughs> mm. <coughs> Start putting dynamite down mole holes. Mole holes. Mole holes. <laughs> well, so uh, yeah, if you if you know what Jessica should do about her moles, and not a dermatologist, the actual little little burrowing animals. Uh, hit her up on our show page or on her personal page. Uh, I don't really have anything this week. We're we're running a little bit long. We went short last week, so just equal those two out. If you like what you heard, like and share us on social media. Inflict us on your friends. Uh, we certainly appreciate every one of you. And if you have any input for stories that you would like us to cover, please send it to us. Uh, whether it's national, international, or local news, please send it to us, and uh, I will run it by the boss. Her name's Jessica, and see if we want to cover it. Probably not. So, <laughs> probably not. Just kidding. So, totally kidding. <laughs> so, for Jessica Salaji, for Eric Cumbie, our editor, I'm Dave Roberts. The, and the moles. Have a great week.